Well, some people are logging on right now. We'll just wait for a few uh, minute or two here and let some log on and we'll get started. But thanks everybody for joining for our third edition of the Grayson Vet Chats. Well, <clears throat> I'm sure some more people are going to join as we're continuing, but I want to go ahead and get started because I know our time is uh, scarce with all of our duties at North Carolina State. This is our third edition of the Grayson Jockey Club Research uh, Vet Chats. Uh, for this one, we're uh, glad to be welcomed by one of our uh, research advisory committee members, Dr. Lauren Schnabel at North Carolina State University. She heads up the Schnabel Lab and actually has a current grant uh, research project that Grayson is funding for the 2020 year. Uh, but without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Schnabel so she can tell you a little bit about what they do at NC State, the Schnabel Lab, and specifically uh, the therapeutic use of stem cells, which her project uh, has been granted for Grayson. So uh, Dr. Schnabel, thanks so much for your time. We appreciate your effort today and your efforts with all of the grants. But First, real quick, if you have a question, we'll do the questions at the end. There's a Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom uh, software package. And if you just type them there at the end, uh, we'll get with Dr. Schnabel to answer those. But Lauren, thanks so much. Uh, it's great having you and hope all is well down there at North Carolina State. Awesome. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, thanks so much for the invitation um, to do this today. Grayson has been a huge part of my uh, career even uh, from the start during my before my PhD and then during my PhD with the 48 lab um, and now as, as my own in the independent lab so I can't thank Grayson enough for all of their support and what it's meant to us here. So without further ado today we're going to talk about the therapeutic use of stem cells uh, specifically for tendon and ligament injuries because that's what uh, most of my research is focused on with stem cells and particularly um, our newly funded Grayson project like Jamie mentioned. And we're going to talk about which type of stem cells, how, and when. I don't have the answers to all of these questions, as you'll see, but we're going to go over what we know so far. So as an outline, I'd like to talk about the principles and goals of regenerative therapies, types and classification of stem cells, current evidence and best use practices. And then we'll talk about my lab's research, um, particularly on treatment timing, which is what our Grayson grant is about, and then um, our work on the immunogenic properties of stem cells and what this means for clinical application. Oh gosh, the mouse is being crazy. So just some, some broad definitions here. So regenerative therapies truly restore or improve normal structure and function. So in the case of a tendon, we want it to heal with totally normal, if possible, fiber patterns so that it's not uh, as prone to re-injury. So when we think about regenerative therapies, um, this gets a little tricky because we used to think that if we naively put in bone marrow derived stem cells, let's say, or any stem cell undifferentiated um, and put it into a tendon lesion that those cells would know to become tenocytes or would become cells of the tendon. We know that's not true now, but there's so many other things they do to still restore structure and function. So I'll explain that when we get to that. And then, Another term that you will probably commonly hear is biologic or a biologic therapy. And biologics stimulate or restore the ability of the body's immune system to fight infection and disease. So they really promote healing um, and help, you know, it help healing in a lot of different ways. And, and in my mind, stem cells kind of cross this line or the stem cells as we currently use them bridge kind of this between the two to both um, restore and improve normal structure and function and also to help the body um, heal properly. So stem cells in the really broad sense are undifferentiated cells that are capable of self-renewal, so multiplying, and they can differentiate into specific lineages if made to do so or, so, or receiving the proper signals to do so. Um, so if you've ever uh, learned embryology, there's these three germ layers, ectoderm, endoderm, and mesoderm. And stem cells, they're defined by how many of those different uh, germ layers they can uh, become. And typically when we think about our multipotent uh, stem cells, 
such as bone marrow and adipose or any of the adult stem cells. Um, those are multipotent and the ones we use are restricted to the mesoderm because as you can see here, these are our orthopedic cells of interest, right? So cartilage, um, adipose, bone, muscle, and tendon and ligament are within there as well. So um, that's how we broadly uh, define those. And that really, it, the term used for that is their potency. So adult stem cells, again, are really multipotent or restricted to a specific germ layer. Um, our true adult stem cells, I think where everybody's most familiar with are bone marrow, adipose, um, hematopoietic, or meaning from the blood, which are also called peripheral blood drive stem cells. And then neonatal cells um, are those such as umbilical cord or umbilical blood and amnion uh, stem cells. So, and this is this picture here is an example of bone marrow derived stem cells that are um, grown out in culture. And then the true embryonic stem cells, um, which are pluripotent, they can become all three germ layers. There's a, there's a lot of, um, that term gets used sort of loosely to, to talk about a lot of different stem cells or stem cell, some of the stem cell products, but true embryonic stem cells are only harvested from eight day old blastocysts, um, which as you can imagine are not easy to obtain. So if someone says to you, these are embryonic stem cells, you have to really ask, is that true? Even if it is true, these pluripotent cells, we have to be very careful with because of their ability to become all three germ layers or because of they're in such an undifferentiated state, um, it's possible that they could form tumors, right? So that's the concern with these pluripotent stem cell types. Another type of pluripotent stem cell that you may have heard about, um, especially sort of over the last uh, decade, uh, because the um, scientists who discovered this did will win the Nobel Prize for induced pluripotent stem cells. And that's when you take adult cells of the body, like cells of the skin, and you can reprogram them um, to become embryonic like uh, pluripotent cells. And that's a really cool thing to be able to do, right? So you're not harvesting embryos, which has some ethical considerations, of course. Um, and what these cells are really being used for now is for studying different diseases because of the fact that if you have a, in human medicine, let's say if you have a patient with a very rare um, disease, you can harvest, let's say of the liver, you can harvest their skin cells, differentiate them to become cells of the liver and study that disease that they have um, with very minimal, obviously harm to the patient. So they're, that's the way they're being used now, those pluripotent cells. We're still very far off from using these in the clinic, the pluripotent, because of their potential hazard. They're, I mean, they're hard to make and they could potentially become tumors uh, or make a tumor if they were injected in a naive state or given the wrong signals internally. So we're gonna focus for sure on the adult stem cells here, the adult mesenchymal stem cells or MSCs as they're called. So these are commonly used in veterinary medicine and also in human clinical trials. Um, and it was really, we started using these at Cornell about um, 2004, 2005. Um, and there were certainly others like CSU also starting to use these cells. Um, so these are um, great in that they are patient specific or autologous as it's called. Um, they can be harvested from the bone marrow or the fat um, and with, with minimal, um, uh, pain to the horse. It's very different than getting uh, bone marrow from a, from a human, as I'll explain. Um, but these cells are modest in terms of their true regenerative ability. And that's what I was uh, referring to earlier when I said we like uh, this first paper we published on um, stem cells for, the, for use in tendon injuries. It's like we really thought they were going to become Tenocytes just know that if we put them there, that's what they were supposed to do. And that, that is not true, but again, they do so many other important things for healing that we're gonna talk about. So they have many positive effects on tissue repair due to the soluble factors they secrete. And we're learning more about their secretome as it's called every day now. Um, but we know they promote um, cell survival, endogenous cell survival by increasing blood flow, reducing cell death, and in decreasing inflammatory and immune responses. And there's a, a couple of good diagrams here that show all the different things that they do so that they can immunomodulate the area of injury. Again, they can stop cell death or apoptosis. 
bring in blood vessels, which is angiogenesis. And then this is really important. They can support the growth and differentiation of progenitor cells at the site of injury. So like I said, if we put these MSCs into a core tendon lesion, those actual cells may not become differentiated into tendon tissue, but they can call in the progenitor cells um, from, from that patient uh, that are locally around to do that. So it's just a different way of having a similar effect. Um, they are anti-scarring, meaning they promote very normal um, uh, tissue healing, and they can attract all these other cytokines and proteins that are important for healing. And this is, again, just showing that in a different way here, how they can modulate inflammation, uh, mitigate inflammation, and bring in these very important progenitor cells. So we've learned a lot about how these cells work, um, but there's still a lot that, that we need to know for sure. So just to go over kind of the different types of cells that are most commonly used now, um, and there's kind of two different categories. So one is the cultured, uh, meaning you're culturing this, the, the cells in the lab usually for about two to three weeks to get a very pure population of cells and also a high cell number. So um, what I use here at NC State is the bone marrow derived uh, stem cells. And there's certainly lots of, that's what we used at Cornell. Um, CSU and many other places are using this type of, of stem cell um, as well. And then if you took the bone marrow and instead of bringing it up to the lab to culture it for those three weeks, you could also um, spin it down in the centrifugation step and make what's called bone marrow concentrate or bone marrow aspirate concentrate. And by doing that, you're still getting stem cells. It's a much lower number. As you're getting stem cells, you're also getting some platelets and other growth factors in that product. The advantage of that is you don't have to wait those three weeks. The disadvantage is, is the cell numbers and it's more of a mixed um, population. So it's just gonna depend on what you're treating, your time frame, um, et cetera. But there's a couple of different companies that make um, these bone marrow concentrate kits. It's usually, they'll be able to do PRP or bone marrow concentrate. Um, I have Harvest uh, Tech, which was uh, bought out by Terumo, but that's the one that I've worked with um, before when I was at Cornell. So. Just showing examples here of how we can harvest bone marrow um, from the sternum of the horse. So the horse is standing um, sedated and we take bone marrow from uh, the sternum. They tolerate this extremely well. We do a local block of the area. Um, they don't seem uh, painful afterwards. They don't guard that area. They're not sort of touched. They can, um, you know, obviously depending on what their injury is, they can be um, written uh, in a short time frame thereafter, they seem very comfortable with this process. Um, you do need to be very careful about staying um, towards these uh, first couple of marrow spaces um, up towards the horse's head and not back towards the tail um, because the, the pericardium is right under the, or right above the sternum and these lower spaces. And that, that, that is a, a very, um, distressing catastrophic thing if that were to happen that you went through uh, the marrow into the pericardium which has been described but the care the most important thing is we're saying up in these um, cranial or towards the head spaces of the marrow and otherwise is a very safe procedure and that's been you know there's been um, tons of those procedures performed now on horses standing you can also get bone marrow from oops oh boy what happened from the hip um, from the ilium of the horse. However, that's really only able to be done on, or you only get good marrow from young horses. So when, if you're just working on young race horses, that's great and that's an awesome place to take it. Um, but from older or middle-aged sport horses, that is not a good place to take the bone marrow, unfortunately, because we'd be great to use that. And it was actually a study, a really nice study from CSU that showed that there was no difference in stem cell quality between the sternum and ilium, um, but the ilium was very hard to get a good quantity of bone marrow from in horses greater than five years old. Um, we've also, they've also shown and others have shown that the greatest number of stem cells is in that first five to 10 mils of the bone marrow aspirate. So ideally, we like to harvest bone marrow from two different sites um, to get the maximum um, cell yield instead of just drawing up, let's say 40 or 60 mils at one site. So that's the protocol that we follow. Um, we use a jam sheeting needle, which is the same as they use in people to harvest bone marrow. 
Um, and uh, we harvest the marrow into syringes with an anticoagulant heparin, um, and again, from two marrow spaces. So this is, this is an older video um, from my uh, PhD, but just to show you an example here, I have to get a, get a new one um, at some point, but this is a good video. Here we have a bunch of syringes laid out because we were making bone marrow um, concentrate, which is a slightly different, just the preparation process is slightly different. But this horse is just standing quietly in the socks. Um, we're blocking the sternum with um, lidocaine or carbocaine, just like we do when we're doing peripheral nerve blocks. Um, here I have the jam sheet needle in place and put a little bit of anticoagulant into the marrow cavity just to stop clotting. And then I'm connecting my um, syringe with anticoagulant and aspirating the bone marrow. And it is a hard, you know, it's a, you, there's a lot of pressure there, negative pressure on the syringe. Um, and then here you see getting marrow. And the main thing is be very careful that you're right on the midline center of the sternum. But again, the horses tolerate this very well. Okay. Um, and then similarly for the fat derived or adipose derived stem cells, there's the two different types of products, the longer term three week culture um, to obtain a pure population, and then a, a quicker procedure, which most of us know as the vet stem product or adipose derived stromal vascular fraction. Fat is a little bit different from bone marrow because it, you know, bone marrow is liquid and it's easy just to culture out the cells. Because fat is tissue, it has to be digested first with collagenase and then processed. So it's not even the quick um, processing of adipose is usually a three-day process versus a 15-minute spin of bone marrow because of that digestion that's needed for the tissue. Um, but it's usually about 20, 15 to 20 grams of fat harvested from just next to the tail head, um, and then it's digested. They can have a little cosmetic blemish. The horses at the site there are a little divot depending on the amount of fat that's taken out. Um, so some, some owners obviously don't, don't like that for, for understandable reasons. So which type of stem cells do we want to use? And this, this is not a comprehensive even list now. There's certainly more coming out about peripheral blood cells, um, but still when we look at the literature as a whole, what we have to date, the most peer-reviewed publications with both preclinical and clinical data are for the bone marrow derived cells. And again, that doesn't mean that next week a great amnion paper couldn't come out um, with even more evidence. But at, at this point in time, I'm personally am most comfortable using the bone marrow derived cells for the evidence that we have. So what are we treating with these cells? So absolutely the number one indication is uh, tendon injuries and ligament injuries, and we'll go over the, the evidence that exists for that. Um, there's also good evidence for the treatment of meniscal injuries within the stifle, um, and then sort of mixed evidence for osteoarthritis and the treatment of cartilage defects. And I'm not gonna spend too much time on that um, because it's outside of the scope of the tendon and ligament talk. But certainly, um, uh, for beginning stage osteoarthritis or joint inflammation, there's quite a bit of evidence just when we're talking about later stage osteoarthritis or these cartilage defects that I think we still have some work to do to figure out exactly how to best use these stem cells. And then just throwing this out there on the horizon, um, certainly these cells are being used for uh, laminitis and, and it could be very promising as you can imagine. Those are very hard studies to do because we're just doing everything to try to save the horse's life. Um, so we're not gonna hold back other treatments to see what our stem cells do alone. Um, but for bone defects is also an exciting area um, for GI disease or um, for colic. Um, and uh, colleagues of mine here at NC State, uh, particularly Dr. Liara Gonzalez, are looking at the use of intestinal stem cells uh, for treating um, uh, ischemia reperfusion or loss of blood supply to the intestine during a colic episode. Um, so that's really exciting work that, that she's doing with her group here. And then also my laboratory um, in collaboration with Dr. Brian Gilger's laboratory has been looking at the use of bone marrow derived stem cells for treating corneal wounds and also for treating immune mediated keratitis because of their immunomodulatory effects. And we have a couple of papers out on that now as well as a clinical trial. So excited to continue that work. Um, I think probably some of you have heard about also the use of stem cells for bleeders, for EIPH, and also for heaves, which is are also exciting areas outside of my comfort zone as an orthopedic surgeon, as are eyes actually, but I'm learning more. 
um, but you may have heard about that on the horizon as well. So let's talk about um, tendon because that really the largest body of evidence that we have for the use of stem cells is for the treatment of tendon injuries. And if any of you have had a horse with a tendon injury, then you, cer you certainly know, um, one, these injuries are very common for us to see as veterinarians, whether you work on sport horses or race horses. I've uh, worked, on, worked on both, work mostly on sport horses here, but I've done a lot of race horse work at um, Cornell and in my time at Rim Riddle. Um, these injuries are very debilitating. Um, they take a really long time to heal. Um, and without other intervention, they heal with tissue that's really inferior in both strength and elasticity. And what that means is that they're then really prone to re-injury um, because they heal with scar tissue that's not normal. And then where that scar and normal tendon interface is, is where they're prone to tear again. Um, and because of that, again, like I said, they have this really high incidence of recurrence of re-injury. So it's just absolutely devastating for any horse or any owner um, to do a six to one year rehab program and then have a re-injury where you have to think about doing that all over again. And as you can imagine or know, for a racehorse, that's just devastating, right? It's to, to, to already lose a year. I mean, they just age out of what they can do. So we really need better ways uh, to treat these kind of injuries. So this is an example of some preclinical data that I did with Dr. Alan Nixon at Cornell um, during my uh, residency. And we created surgical, surgically created, or sorry, collagenase induced tendon lesions in horses. So it's a way that you can um, make a tendon lesion in, in a research horse, um, obviously with a lot of pain meds on board and they're well um, taken care of, but we use this model to be able, able to study what the stem cells are doing in a controlled way. So what I wanted to show here is um, when we made tendon lesions and then treated them with either stem cells on the left or the control was saline on the right, I hope you can see how much more organized the tendon fiber pattern is with the stem cells versus the control. Um, and this is called um, polarized light crimping, but basically the, the tendon has this very specific orientation of collagen, which is really cool. Um, and it relies on that for, it, for its strength and its elasticity. So I think you can see here with the stem cells, you have this organized crimp pattern versus the control where it's very disorganized and irregular. And then on, the, on the, these green and red panels on the right, we were staining for um, collagen type one in, or in green, which is the more normal type collagen um, that we want tendons to heal with. And we can see that the stem cell uh, treated horses have more green or normal looking collagen compared to the control. Um, and then this is a, a really great study from Roger Smith's group um, with Godwin as the first author. Um, and it's, this is even from 2011 now, but this is really the longest term um, follow-up that we have on any stem cell product for, and especially for this many horses. So they were looking at naturally occurring superficial digital flexor tendon injuries and national hunt horses mostly, although there's a few flat race horses in there um, that were treated with stem cells versus when they compared this to a conventional treatment from a previous study. But what I wanna show you here is that we can see in these national hunt, hunt horses, the re-injury rate without stem cells was at about 55%, and it dropped all the way down to 25% with the use of stem cells. Um, in quite a large number of horses, 105 horses. In flat race horses and the race horses, um, thoroughbred race horses, especially in the US, we know this re-injury rate is even higher. Usually we think of it about 65%, um, even upwards of 70% that they could re-injure the same tendon. Um, and they only have a few horses here, but showing that they dropped that to about 50% and um, I think our at least my clinical experience has been that it's probably lower than that. Um, I think the most comparable thing that we have here at NC State is our ventures who are galloping, um, where we've really seen a very nice reduction in re-injury with the use of stem cells compared to what we used to see. So this was a great study to support um, the use of stem cells for the treatment of tendon injuries. The other study I wanted to mention um, with some longer term outcome data was that for treating meniscal tears. And actually stem cells, and initially in that there's some really um, incredible goat meniscus studies that were some of the first 
exciting stem cell studies could be performed, um, looking at the use of them for treating municipal terrors and injuries. And in this paper from um, Dr. Ferris from CSU, they showed how horses that were refractory or non-responsive to stifle arthroscopy and other treatments for uh, meniscal tears. So after surgery, they still failed to return to work. How many improved with the use of intraarticular uh, stem cell injections uh, following surgery when previously they had not been? Um, and I, that's really my main indication for using stem cells within a joint is if they have a, a meniscal tear or another soft tissue injury within the joint, um, like a collateral ligament or ACL. We don't see too many ACL tears in horses because they're usually uh, very severe if they do happen. But we do see a lot of meniscal tears and also um, uh, collateral ligament injuries. Okay, so when we think about considerations for stem cells, um, we really need to think about, are we using our patient's uh, own cells or are we reaching for an allogeneic product? Um, as an area, of, a passionate area of mine, so I've done a lot of research on that. My PhD is on immunology of stem cells. So I'm gonna come back to that um, again uh, towards the end about our current research. But you know, the, the advantage of autologous is it's very safe, no worry about an immune response. The disadvantage is you have to wait to culture them if you wanna use a culture expanded product or pure product. Um, allogeneic would be great in that it could be ready to go. Um, but it, in my opinion, there are certainly some safety concerns about the immune response. Uh, the systemic health at the time of harvest when you're doing, um, well, whether it's autologous or allogeneic, you have to be really careful that um, your patient is as healthy as and hydrated or your horse is as healthy as and hydrated as they can be um, to get a good harvest. Um, I do try to avoid harvesting the cells right after general anesthesia, because they're just not in, in the, you know, they're still recovering from that. So if it's a, they're having surgery for something, I know we want to do stem cells afterwards. I'm going to harvest the bone marrow prior to surgery, um, certainly prior, prior to fasting and those types of things. And it's even more uh, prominent in the small animals when they're really being held off feed and, uh, and other things prior to surgery to do that with any of the biologics, actually. And then also culture and storage uh, methods used, not to go into too much detail, but we've always used to grow ourselves. Um, and I, we, you still can for the beginning of the culture in what's called fetal bovine serum, it just because it's full of nutrients and the cells love it. But this is bovine as, it, as, as the name says, um, and it has some foreign proteins on the surface that can cause a flare or a immune response. Um, so now we culture the cells in our patients, the horse's own autologous serum, and that's certainly um, my preference. So we just harvest blood at the same time as we get bone marrow, and then use that serum as a nutrition source for the cells when they're in culture, and also for injecting uh, back into the horse. So some tips I've learned <laughs> along the way. So these are these are living cells, so you can't mix them up or aspirate them back and forth in the needle like you would a drug. Um, so we need to treat the cells really carefully be nice with how we're shipping them if they're getting shipped. Um, we also don't combine the cells with antibiotics or steroids uh, injections at the same time um, that can harm the cells. There's also um, evidence now that this, the cells on their own can have some antimicrobial properties. Um, so there's, we don't really think there's a need to do that. And we certainly don't want to harm or give something that's cytotoxic to the cells, which we know some of the, the commonly used antibiotics are. And then I do sometimes inject the cells with platelet-rich plasma or hyaluronic acid or HA. I just never mix them in the same syringe because they can clot, which has happened to me before. And that will ruin your day pretty quickly, ruin my day. So when we think about delivery methods, I wanted to go over some ways and you may have, have seen these um, to deliver these cells. Um, and I have a note here, do not give intravenously uh, systemically or in the jugular vein because the cells, because of their size, actually all get trapped in the lungs. And that's a bone skin image of labeled cells showing them all in the lungs. So I'll retract that statement if you're giving the stem cells to treat heaves um, or an inflammatory sort of airway disease. Um, but when we're talking about tendon and ligament injuries, we are not giving the cells through the jugular vein um, because they, there's no way that they'll get to the tendon and that's, that's been shown. Um, so my preference is always to give the cells by a direct intralesional injection into the tendon or ligament injury if possible. If that's not possible because it's within the hoof capsule or the horse has a laceration or a skin disease, um, then we have some other ways to do that. 
um, like regional limb perfusion, which I'll um, come back to, or if it if the lesion is within a tendon sheath or bursa or within the joint, then we can deliver by intersynovial injection or into the bursa or joint. Um, and again, the regional limb perfusion um, is great for multiple lesions or inaccept inaccessible lesions, like I mentioned, uh, whether that's in the hoof capsule or um, or you have a laceration overlying the area. So intralesional means we're putting a, a needle directly into the lesion under ultrasound guidance and injecting our stem cells that way. So just an example here of a superficial digital flexor tendon core lesion, the bright white line uh, with the arrow is the needle uh, going into that lesion. You can watch your stem cells uh, be delivered that way. This is an example of a a really cool technique that we have at NC State, and we published on this a few years ago now, um, just showing how um, we can actually, some of these um, lesions are very hard to see um, on ultrasound, and we only see them well on MRI, uh, but we can't inject the horse with a needle while it's in the magnet um, in the MRIs. But we can, with our technology here, take the MRI images and load that on our ultrasound machine um, and we can use a GPS tracking system around the horse's leg with the ultrasound to lock on the anatomy and then watch yourself in real time with the ultrasound inject into the lesion that's seen on MRI. So this is an example of a um, oblique sesamoidian ligament injury in this horse, or so just right below the sesamoid bone here. And we can see that injury on MRI. It was very difficult to see on plain ultrasound, but we can fuse the images and you can see our needle going directly into that um, lesion on ultrasound now, and the, the bright white kind of um, squirrel that comes up is the stem cells going into that lesion. So this is really um, a, a fun thing for us to be able to do, to be very accurate about how we deliver our injections to the proper place. Um, and th this is again, one of the, what this is a study from Roger Smith's group that really solidified my preference for wanting to do intralesional. So this was a really nice, again, a bone scan study with labeled stem cells where um, Ooh, I mean, cursor issue, where you can see the very bright signal of intralesional even at 12 hours post-injection versus regional limb perfusion. I was still very happy that this study actually showed that when you delivered the cells um, via regional limb perfusion, they did get to the tendon injury, which is here, but they just didn't stay as long and in such a great concentration. So for this reason, um, like I mentioned, the interlesional is still my preference, but there are certainly times where we can't do that. Um, when we have a soft tissue injury within a tendon sheath, which we see a lot of those uh, deep lesions within the sheath here on our sport horses, and especially the jumpers, um, or within a navicular bursa, for example, with navicular syndrome, or within a joint, um, then we can deliver the cells directly into that synovial structure. So here's a good example of, um, this is a, case we did a few years ago, but I'll never forget this because we were really suspect on ultrasound that this horse had a tear in the deep, um, a border tear on the edge of the deep to build flexor tendon. And when we scope this horse, you can see just this little bundle of collagen sort of sticking out abnormally here. And you just lightly touch that with the probe and all the fibers um, sprung out. So this was a large lesion kind of waiting to explode. Um, so debrided this all at surgery, which really helps um, to calm the inflammation. So when you have all these sort of extruded fibers of the tendon, like you see in this middle picture, that's very irritating to the tendon sheath, very uncomfortable for the horses. So we clean this all up at surgery and then follow up with stem cell injection. Um, this bottom picture here is an example of a very severe deep digital flexor tendon lobe lesion within the navicular bursa. Um, these are very hard cases to treat, um, but we will um, try to help the horses at least get more comfortable or to be um, pasture sound, even if they can't be performance horses. Th this is a very severe lesion that I show you here um, by injecting um, cells either into the navicular bursa or with regional limb perfusion. Slide show is being crazy. So, so this is what regional limb perfusion is. If you, have, if you haven't seen this before, we do a lot of regional limb perfusion um, with antibiotics to treat uh, infections of the distal limb. So things like cellulitis, um, when we have infected joints, we do regional limb perfusions because we're able to really concentrate the antibiotics to the distal limb with a tourniquet in place. Um, but the same principle is true that we can deliver the stem cells that way 
um, uh, to, to guide them um, to that area and then distill them if we can't access it directly. So here's an example of a butterfly um, cat, a needle in place with a tourniquet above it on the limb to inject um, our cells. This is a case I, I took care of for quite some time and um, luckily he's doing very well now, but this was a very severe superficial digital flexor tendon laceration. Um, the laceration was into the sheath because of its location. So um, he was treated for um, a septic tendon sheath and then put in a cast as well to let this tendon heal. So on the ultrasound here, um, you can see this. So this is the deep digital flexor tendon, and this is the only part of the superficial that's sort of visible anymore. So this was where the tear was and all disrupted um, superficial digital flexor tendon on this side. Um, so once we got in a minute, the wound closed, the tendon sheath flushed, um, we uh, treated uh, PIP with uh, stem cells um, for, for a series of injections uh, to get him to heal as, as well as possible. And th this is this, I, I put this in here, um, this is a confusing topic, but there's, you can do regional limb perfusion either um, through the vein or through the artery. And perhaps you've seen both. Um, I still use the vein just because of my comfort level. There has been some reported complications, especially with doing intraarterial with a tourniquet in place, but the newer literature um, and colleagues um, at Davis and also um, at CSU talking to them about performing this without a tourniquet um, they've had good success and, and no um, complications uh, with arterial thrombosis or forming a clot basically in the artery, which we don't want to do. So I think that is going to be the way to go. In the future, it's just a little more technically um, demanding uh, to do uh, with ultrasound guidance, but we can certainly, we have evidence that both with um, delivering through the vein or the artery that the cells um, get to where they need to go. Okay, and then onto intraarticular delivery. Again, this is, in my hands, we use this for the treatment of meniscal or soft tissue injuries within the joint. And our goal here is really to, to treat these horses hopefully very early and prevent them from getting post-traumatic osteoarthritis. So this is, um, I hope this is a geograph of, of an image for anybody, but this is a, a very severe meniscal and uh, cranial ligament of the meniscus tear um, in a horse that, um, this horse was unfortunately very, very painful and lame. Um, also had a lot of cartilage damage. So the owners did elect euthanasia at uh, the time of surgery based on our very severe findings. And you can um, see in the necropsy um, picture here that, um, that the, this was, is a normal cranial ligament of the lateral meniscus here, this structure that I'm circling. And this was completely obliterated. So just had lost this attachment um, to the meniscus. Again, which I, I don't have on this picture here, but the horse did also have severe um, cartilage damage um, and, and was gonna be quite uncomfortable, unfortunately. So our goal is to catch these early and really stop that from happening. Um, so this is the information in the horse's joint and the abnormal cartilage here um, on the condyle. So we really wanna catch these and treat them as early as we can. Um, and our current treatment recommendations, I really follow from that published paper that I already showed you from CSU, but we usually do 20 million cells with HA. And the frequency of injection is dependent upon the horse's response to therapy, but usually we do a series of at least three. Same is really true for tendon, depending upon how fast the, the lesion is going in. So how many cells do we give? And I mean, to be completely honest, we do not know what the optimal stem cell number is. So our initial studies, the ones that we did at Cornell and others used 10 million uh, to 20 million cells for some of the joints we're using more, like a stifle where we use up to 50 million, but we really don't know. Um, in some of the tendon studies, the horses with unfavorable outcomes were injected with fewer cells than those with favorable, but to be to really figure this out, we need to do dose-dependent response studies. That's just hard to do and hard to get that many horse uh, numbers, but I think that is important for us to do. And some other species, um, especially the um, rodent models uh, for stem cell use, they have found that there's sort of an intermediate number, which is best, that too few is not good, but too many also um, can, can be detrimental. So there probably is really an optimal window that we wanna find out. And then what do we inject these stem cells with? 
um, and, uh, and actually as a starting point, what type of stem cells. So we certainly need more data on the amnion umbilical cord peripheral blood cells that are coming out um, more and more now. And then how, what do we inject these cells with? Should we inject them just with the serum like I mentioned or with platelet-rich plasma or another biologic? And that work is really still to be determined. So now I'm gonna move on to treatment timing. So we've had really this paradigm that we wanna wait until we pass the acute inflammatory state um, to treat these horses, especially with tendon lesions and core lesions in particular, that you wanna let the inflammation subside and then go back and treat them with stem cells. Um, and I, I put up this paper here from a really great colleague um, in Spain that I've worked with on her work in the joints. And she's showed that sometimes inflammation can um, affect the viability of the stem cells and what they're able to differentiate into. Um, and again, this, this was in joints. And we were really curious about what would happen um, in tendons, because I had read some other literature um, for tendon that you might actually want to treat very early on in the inflammatory phase if possible. Um, and that's what led us to our Grayson Jockey Club proposal, which was uh, funded for this year, which we're incredibly grateful for. Um, so our, the title of this grant is Enhancing Efficacy of MMCs for Tendon Healing. And we're actually proposing that the peak inflammatory environment might be the most beneficial time to implant MSCs um, as that inflammatory environment will cause the MSCs to produce pro-healing cytokines and growth factors, meaning that will stimulate them to produce more of what we want for tendon healing. So these are our hypotheses just cut and pasted from the grant and our, our first um, specific aim and hypotheses is that that expression of inflammatory cytokines is gonna change over time following acute injury. And more so, we, we know that's gonna be true, but that we can measure what's happening using these novel ultrafiltration probes within the legions. I'm gonna show you what those are because we're really excited about that. And then once we um, can collect uh, the, the tendon fluid, figure out what those inflammatory cytokines are, we can culture stem cells with that and make sure and see if our hypothesis is true. So do the stem cells secrete more of what we want for healing with those inflammatory cytokines or not? So as a, a bit of background, um, this is a great uh, colleague and a co i on our Grayson um, grant, Dr. Kristen Messenger, who's an anesthesiologist and a pharmacologist at NC State. But she was using these BASI ultrafiltration, um, commercially available BASI probes, ultrafiltration probes, to measure drug delivery to certain areas like within the abdomen or the sub Q underneath an incision. And um, myself and my graduate student at the time, who's also awesome, Dr. Alex Berglund, we were chatting about you know, need, needing to figure out what was going on in the tendon. And Kristen was like, well, could you put a probe in it? And I was like, well, I don't really know, but I'll try. Um, so that's really where that idea happened uh, randomly during a conversation as, as usually good ideas do. So we took some um, cadaver limbs and tendons and just first tried to see if I could even make a lesion and feed these probes into the lesion. Um, so you can see on the left here, probe um, hooked up to the connection tube. It's a vacuum cleaner blood tube is how this works. Um, and you could see that I was able to feed the probe up through the tendon and have it be within the tendon fibers. It's showing the cut edge so you can see what it looks like. So that was just our proof of principle on a cadaver limb that this could work. Um, and then we had a few pilot research horses. I'll play the video here. So this is a surgical model of um, tendon lesion induction as opposed to the collagenase, which I mentioned before, where we take an arthroscopic burr and um, sort of burr a hole in the tendon under general anesthesia. These horses have their limbs blocked. Um, they're also administered NSAIDs and they actually stay remarkably comfortable um, during this model, which is, which is great. Um, so they tolerate this very well. So we're making a core lesion, just like what happened in naturally occurring tendonitis, and then threading our probe um, up into that tendon lesion so we can collect the fluid and figure out which cytokines are present. So here are some ultrasound examples of the probe fibers within the tendon, both in the transverse plane and the longitudinal plane. And then this is showing one of our horses with the um, tendon collection probe system in place. Um, so you can see just scanning very comfortably. Our tubing is coming out of the skin from our incision down here and up into our collection system. Um, the horses can exercise with these in place and they did um, extremely 
well with this system, and we just covered this with a with a cotton and a polo to protect it. So, in our preliminary data that we used for this grazing ground for the to get this grazing ground with our pilot horses, we were only we were able to measure a few of the key cytokines that we know are important in tendonitis, but not all of the cytokines we wanted to. But we were able to show that IL one beta peaked very early on around three days and then declined rapidly thereafter. Um, and um, IL-1 was more consistent and then IL-6 peaked very quickly and then came down after the first day. So we were really intrigued by these results and particularly the timing of interleukin-1 beta. Um, and we did check to make sure we were you know, worried about with that joint paper that I showed you before, what um, are the fluid that we were collecting from the tendons with the cells be okay um, with that inflammatory presence. And it did not affect the cellular viability either when we um, cultured the cells with our tendon collection fluid or straight IL-1 beta. Um, our cell counts were less, which is not surprising with the tendon effluent or our probe, just because it doesn't have any nutrient source in there alone as that ultrafiltrate when we took it out. But the important thing here to look at is that it didn't affect cell viability. So we're really happy with those results. And actually, when we cultured our stem cells with interleukin-1 beta, we were able to show that we got increased concentrations um, of really important growth factors for tendon healing. So VEGF, um, PGE2, and IL-6, these cytokines are also very important for tendon healing compared to untreated cells. We had significantly higher concentrations when the cells were in the presence of IL-1 beta. We also made sure um, on histologic analysis that these probes weren't causing inflammation themselves. Um, that would falsely skew our data and um, I hope you can appreciate these are the cut loops of the probes, but there's really no inflammatory cells surrounding them. The tissue is very quiet. Um, so we're also very happy about that. These probes, um, aside from what Dr. Messenger has used them for, um, Dr. Van Epps um, also has used them at Penn for laminitis studies. Um, under the hook capsule, and he also found that they were non-irritating in that location. But what we didn't like about these commercial probes was that we weren't collecting all the cytokines of interest. So these probes basically have a specific pore size, and you have to, the molecule of interest or protein of interest has to be less than that pore size to get through. Um, and the proteins are fairly small that we want to collect back, but they can stick to each other. So instead of being 30 called kilodaltons, if there's three of them together, then they're 90 kilodaltons and they can't get through the probe. So Bayesi is a tremendous company. Their customer service is fantastic. And I say, can you make us bigger ones? And they sent us 100 and 300 kilodalton probes. Um, and we were able to show using those probes that we could um, collect bigger uh, proteins that we know stick together for those dimers and trimers, like I mentioned, such as TNF alpha. And we were able to recover them in the 300 and 100 kilodalton probes when we weren't in the 30. So we were super excited about this until, until I really thought about the size of the probe that they were sending us. So this was our original 30 kilodalton and this is the 100 that they made. And I was like, whoa, how am I, just look at the sheer size difference of that, especially this connector piece. And I was like, I'm never gonna fit that into a tendon. So really, again, tremendous customer service, worked with them um, and they were able to make us this 100 Kildalton probe with a single loop, which I actually prefer um, technically uh, to get into the tendon lesion compared to the original one. So this was much more reasonable size. Um, and then this is what we propose to use in our Grayson grant. Um, other, a couple of other modifications we learned from our pilot study just was to collect the fluid more often to change out the tubes and to put um, tubes with some protease inhibitors so that stops protein degradation. Because if you think about it, these tubes are against the horse's hot leg under a hot bandage and then they're exercising some as well. So that's all things that cause proteins to break down, which we don't want. So um, we're excited to try all these modifications. And as a little progress update here, our study is underway with these new probes. Really excited. We actually did surgery on the first two horses this past Monday. Um, I have an awesome new graduate student, um, Dr. Drew Co, working on, on me on this with me on this project now, um, and he uh, finished his surgery residency at CSU and then came here for his PhD. Um, so it's awesome to have him on this project, and he's done a great job. As an example here of one of our horses with their collection system in place um, and doing very well. So.
can't wait to see these results um, when we get them. And uh, as soon as we have all our tendon fluid collected, um, we'll measure the cytokines and then we'll stimulate our stem cells with those uh, different cytokines in the laboratory and figure out when the cells are being primed to secrete what we want for tendon healing to guide our injections. And so what if our hypothesis is true that we want to treat really early on during inflammation, right? So I mentioned that IL-1 beta peaked at day three. If that's the case, we wouldn't be able to use autologous MSCs in the traditional way that we use them now, right? Because they take three weeks to culture. So we would either have to have bank cells from that horse ready to go. Um, that sounds sort of okay, except that, you know, it is still is an invasive procedure to collect bone marrow. And the cells also don't last forever in the liquid nitrogen tank. Um, so after a couple of years, they start to lose their viability. So I don't think we're quite ready to have, you know, bang cells from every horse. So that really leads us to um, using allogeneic cells. So I'm gonna talk just at the end of here, I know we're getting short on time, but about um, autologous versus allogeneic cells. So. Again, autologous cells take several weeks to culture. We also know that um, different horses have different quality cells, and certainly that quantity and quality of stem cells decrease with advanced donor age. Um, so for a lot of the middle-aged or older sport horses that we treat here, they don't have the quality of stem cells that a three-year-old racehorse would have, for example. Um, so it, I certainly do not dispute at all that it would be great um, to have allogeneic cells so that it's practical, um, but they also need to be safe and efficacious. But I would love to have screened, um, ready to go allogeneic cell cells for off the shelf therapy. Um, unfortunately though, and I've spent a lot of, of, of time working on this, um, starting with my PhD, just because the cells are immunomodulatory doesn't mean that they're immune privileged or not recognized by the immune system. So we've showed and several papers now and other groups have as well, that if, if a horse is not of the same immune, sort of like a blood type, if they're of a different immune type from a different, from um, a donor horse, the recipient horse or the patient is gonna have an immune response to those cells where, where they generate antibodies and those antibodies can target the stem cells for death. So we've showed that, um, that, uh, the mismatched um, stem cells are, so MHC is an immune haplotype. If they're MHC mismatched, um, they generate an antibody response. And if you mix that serum with antibodies with the stem cells, that serum with the antibodies will kill the stem cells just as they would um, to, to leukocytes. So um, that's, you know, we, I can't imagine that that would be good for efficacy if our cells were getting killed right away. We haven't shown uh, yet that that changes efficacy. So that's a future step. And then there's other uh, mouse models that show when they're also immune mismatched, the stem cells that they don't persist uh, for longer than a few days um, because they're killed off by the antibody response. So that is of course a question is how long is long enough for the cells to stay around? And that's another question that we need to answer. But at least as of right now, um, we've showed that cytotoxic antibodies are capable of killing donor stem cells in vitro, um, and that there was no significant difference between the, the, the cytotoxicity for, on stem cells versus leukocytes or immune cells. Um, and for that reason, I don't use allogeneic MHC mismatch stem cells. Um, it, it's not trivial to figure out the haplotypes of these horses, so it's not like we can do a five-minute test to figure out to match them to a different recipient. So. That's why it's a bit cumbersome at this time and it needs to be explored uh, more. We also need to know what actually happens in vivo. So this is a really nice study from UC Davis showing that the antibody response to mismatched stem cells can be different at different parts of the body. So there are some areas of the body that seem to be immune privileged or have a barrier to the immune system like the eye, but actually their highest numbers that you can see here for antibody binding were in the tendon. So that doesn't bode well for us um, in the tendon application, meaning we need to really think about how we can control the immunogenicity of these cells. Um, so that's also a focus of my laboratory um, is to really define the immune environment post-injury and to determine if we can manipulate those markers that are expressed on the cell surface, which is how the recipient immune response identifies them as foreign. So can we downregulate MHC class one and class two expression on our stem cells so that they're not recognized 
by the by the patient's immune system. Um, and we're using TGF beta two to do this, um, and this is with funding from the Morris Animal Foundation. So we have a current study looking at the ability of TGF beta two um, to decrease surface expression and stop um, cytotoxicity of the cells. And we have shown that TGF beta two is able to quite effectively in vitro downregulate and stop that cytotoxicity, as you can see in the figure here. Um, but still have more work to do on that as well. So increasing our numbers and expanding upon um, those results. The bonus, and this, this is a, what's called a heat map of gene expression where um, red is you have more, you're hotter, uh, blue is cold, you have less. But in the TGF beta two treated cells, we also had increased collagen type one that we want for tendon healing, um, as well as some other important um, factors for a tendon extracellular matrix. So that might be an added bonus that the fact that TGF beta was causing the stem cells to secrete more matrix as well. So this is Dr. Berglund here, who, who's really was leading up this project as part of her PhD. And she's um, uh, now an independent researcher uh, working on um, figuring out this TGF beta 2 signaling pathway, but very excited about these results and also um, using TGF beta hopefully in the future. So wrapping up there, I hope I gave you some food for thought, but we still have a lot to learn. Um, that's what keeps me excited about research and um, trying to figure these things out. So we still need to figure out, um, which thanks to, to Grayson, we'll hopefully we'll figure out this answer of when to treat, um, what our optimal cell number is, what should be the optimal cell type and vehicle or what the cells are delivered with. And then another thing I'm really interested in is, is the interaction with other rehab modalities. So we don't know what the effect of things like PEMF or a laser or shockwave are on these cells. Right now, I currently space out when I do these rehab with when we inject the cells, meaning wait a week or two, um, but perhaps they could be beneficial to do at the same time, we just don't know. So all lots of things to learn. Um, I'd like to acknowledge my lab members and our uh, laboratory animal um, uh, crew staff that take great care of all our research horses, um, certainly my collaborators, um, and my mentors at Cornell and all our funding and especially Grayson for um, inviting me to give this talk and for our study. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, Dr. Schnabel, thanks so much for your time and for everybody still on, there's a Q&A button at the bottom if you wanna type a question, but I've got a few already. And the first one is our research that we funded is going to figure out when's the best time to start, it, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. So the question is on the other end, say I've got a horse with a deep uh, digital uh, flexor tendon injury, they've been off for a year, can they do stem cells then? Yeah, that's a great question. So we actually are working on other ways too, to see sometimes you have to stimulate inflammation in a chronic lesion, if that makes sense. So if our hypothesis for this Grayson study is true, that you inflammation is best, there's two ways to do that. So you can either create inflammation in the tendon with a surgical procedure, um, or you could prime the cells in the lab first and then put them into a chronic tendon lesion. But when you've had a, a tendon that's been rested for a year, but still isn't sound, often they have scar tissue um, and other stuff that's kind of filled in there. And we do have newer procedures now, 10X is one of them, um, is what it's called, or FAST, focused aspiration of scar tissue, where we can actually go in um, with an ultrasound guided um, device and it basically takes out the scar tissue. You're leaving a hole that you now have to fill in with something like stem cells, but it's better than having mineral and scar there, we think, and we're, that's being investigated. Um, but that's an awesome question that we deal with a lot in the clinic when we're presented with these kind of stalled out or chronic tendon lesions, yeah. Yeah, and so that leads me to perfectly to the second question, which I believe you said earlier, rehab time, for high performance horses is six months to a year yeah. uh, for the lot of the tendon. Have we done any research yet or have you all done any research to show what the decrease time is by using stem cells on those? So it, at least in my clinical experience, I've not done specific research on this. I, I, I always tell owners, it's not that you're gonna decrease the, re, we, we're gonna do the same rehab protocol and the same rehab time, generally speaking, unless there's, we see really amazing healing, but what our goal is to stop that re-injury. So we still wanna give the horses time and the cells time 
to make normal collagen and fiber pattern in the tendon instead of this scar. And then they won't, they'll be a lot less likely to re-injure there. So I, that's the way that I always explain it. And that's definitely what I have in my head, at least until I see other evidence to say um, contrary is we're gonna follow this. We're not necessarily, we're not shortening the rehab, but we're preventing re-injury. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so you also talked about you have to make sure the horse is healthy enough at whatever age they are to culture their own stem cells. Is there an age restriction on this that you would say as a veterinarian, too young, too, you know, what is that? No, I mean, so you can never be too young. You'll get really nice cells from, from the youngest horses. But um, I mean, we, I've drawn bone marrow on 28, 29 year old horses and I can still grow the cells and we use them because that's still what I'm the most comfortable with now, but they're just not you know, they don't grow as fast as cells from younger horses, et cetera. And then when I said that about systemic health, so when we culture these cells, we always um, submit a sample to our micro lab to make sure they're not bacterial contaminated, meaning we've introduced bacterial in the mm -hmm. culture, right? Which can happen. And I had this, this one horse that, you know, I feel like I always sound crazy when I say this, but we thought it had a, truly had a snake bite. So it had this really gross, um, sort of necrotic lesion over the back of its tendon on its leg, you know, the skin had slough, there was exposed tendon um, and the tendon was, was infected. And that's why we were, so the horse was cleaned up, it was in a cast and we were trying to treat with stem cells with regional lymph perfusion. So I, I tried to culture these cells like three times and kept getting bacterial contamination, which I thought we were somehow doing in the lab, although we, you know, no, no, nothing else was contaminated anyway went back and took a blood culture of the horse. Well, it was, it ha had systemic bacteremia from whatever had happened in this injury, right? So um, bacteria in the bloodstream, which is also goes into the bone marrow. So that's, that was really eye-opening to me. I never really thought about that before. Obviously that's an uncommon injury to have, but it just, it just, you know, goes to show you if the, I mean, that's a problem with these, like a laminitis horse is usually going to be very debilitated, right? Mm -hmm. Most cases are, you know, especially a laminitis from endotoxemia or post colic episode um, or surgery. So, you know, th those aren't good cases to use the horse's own stem cells. They're just not, they're too debilitated at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Well, a couple of years ago, well, guys, may have been 10, a decade now ago, they were selling some uh, yearlings and they announced over the speaker that these horses would be sold with umbilical cord, sold with umbilical cord stem cells. Are we at a point yet where that's a viable solution that a horse is cultured or you have umbilical uh, stem cells at a young age and it travels with the horse and stored properly? Yeah, so that that's a really good question. In like the liquid nitrogen tanks that most of us have, like in our laboratories here, they, you know, they last for a couple of years, but then they really start to lose viability. So the sort of storage, those special storage facilities like they have for human umbilical products and cells, I mean, th those are at a completely different, you know, price point than what we have available to us here in our laboratories. And, and those facilities are made, you know, to keep the cells very long term. But currently what most of us have, no, I mean, no, not as for storage for long term. Yeah, I thought it was an interesting idea and boy, it could give you yeah. a competitive advantage if you were yeah. to get injured or you like that certain horse or but boy, I, I thought, God, that's a long way to keep and store yeah. and manage. And how do you know it's going to go with the horse? And there's a lot of questions. And so. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I think in the, in the future that could, I mean, it's always going to be easier to figure out a way to safely use allogeneic cells or to figure out which cells. So some of the fetal cells don't express as many of those immune markers on their surface. Those are probably safe. You know, we just, I think there's still a lot to learn, but there's no question that like, having cells ready to go available that are safe to use would be, you know, the, the most beneficial thing. Yeah. And that, I, unless I see another question that gets me to it, my final question, which is the difference between the cultured cell from the horse and the cells from the laboratory. If we, if there had been any research done about what injury is specific uh, or uses uh, those cells better than a tendon or a bone or a, you know, do they match up or is it all individual to the horse? Wait, I'm not saying, so if, 
like for one of the cultural uh, stem cells is it better for tendons or bone or... Oh, oh you mean it's culture expanding versus like that quick spin that i mentioned yeah yeah, yeah Which, okay is it match, do they match yeah. up with the uh, uh yeah i don't or... think we really know that yet so that the culture expanded um for sure has more it has just so many greater number of stem cells that we want to mm -hmm. use um, and there's not a lot of studies on the constant on the bone marrow concentrate at least for um, tendon lesions. The initial studies were in joints, and in the in the study that we did with Dr. Portier, we did have very favorable results with the bone marrow concentrated, but it wasn't directly compared to cultured stem cells. So um, I think yeah, I just, we're still. It was really good to have them. On, yeah, he said it was really good to have them on hand. I didn't know. Yeah. You know, you you looked, you went to the lab, or you got a, a horse in. You were at the clinic, and you said, "Gosh." This is a tendon injury. It's perfect for these kinds of stem cells yeah. we already have on hand. No, I gotcha. Yeah, I don't think we we don't know that yet. Yeah. Yeah, we're just so early in this science that we're yeah. still uh, going through it, huh? Yeah, exactly. Well, we're coming up on just past an hour, and I don't want to take too much more of your time. I just want to say thanks so much. This was yeah. great. Uh, a lot of our horses across all breeds are suffering with. Uh, yeah. Some form of some form of tendon injury, whether it be a two and three year old races racing horse or the eight and nine year old dressage or jumping horse, uh, they all see it. So this uh, research is going to be excellent to go across all breeds and disciplines. Thank you. Well, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, thanks everyone for attending. And if you didn't get to see it, we'll post it to the YouTube page and sit on our social channels. Uh, and if you want to follow uh, Dr. Schnabel, uh, she has the Schnabel Lab has their own social channels as well as long as the North Carolina State uh, University. And we thank you guys down there. Uh, stay safe and keep up the great work. Thank you so much. Take care, Bye, everybody. Guys. Stay well. Bye.